My topic today is one that's near and dear to my heart uh, because, in fact, when we talk about sharing the gospel with Mormons, that's something that uh, is real to me because I actually grew up in the Mormon church. Uh, I was raised <laughs> as a Mormon and a very complicated family story uh, involving a shotgun wedding and other things, but uh, my mom's side of the family are all devout Mormons. Uh, they would do service in the temple and missions and all types of things. Um, so I was baptized into the church at the age of eight, and that's the typical age of baptism for Mormons. And I was a, I was a good kid, uh, studied, learned all of the, the theology, memorized the articles of faith, uh, went through all of the hoops. And at age 12, I received the Aaronic Priesthood and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I was very involved in church life. I've done uh, service in the temples, doing baptisms for the dead and other things, so I was very involved, but at some point after that, I became very disillusioned uh, with the life of the church. Uh, when we look at Mormonism, it looks all happy and fuzzy on the outside, but indeed there's a darker side and there's a lot of uh, plastic faces that people put on when they show up to church and dress in their Sunday best uh, and a lot of hypocrisy. And as a teenager, that drove me away from, from the church. And around age 14, uh, due to family circumstances and things happening in the church, uh, I, I totally turned my back on God and wanted nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with, with the Mormon faith, nothing to do with God. Uh, so I would have called my, myself an atheist at that point. And I moved back to live with my father uh, in southern Idaho from Utah. I actually grew up going to Temple Square. My uh, aunt worked at the church office building right downtown, so very familiar with all of those things. And uh, lived a life of rebellion against God and pursuing my own selfish pleasures. And after many more years, 14 more years, God saved me uh, from my selfishness at age 28. And now I stand here today able to uh, share with you what God has done in my life and, and uh, just a testimony of how God works in different people to bring them to different points where uh, now I have a knowledge of what happens in the church and the inner workings and, and share those things with you. So I'm, I'm glad to do that today. So let's jump right into what the church uh, teaches and who they are. So the, the official name of the people you know as Mormons is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but that's a mouthful, so they will often refer to themselves as Mormons or the abbreviation LDS for Latter-day Saints. And those are common terms that they would use, they wouldn't find those offensive. Uh, but you'll notice that the name there, Jesus Christ, is in the name of their church. And so they're very insistent that they're Christians. Uh, they, will, they will insist that they're a part of Christianity and the broad scale. And we know the Mormons as missionaries who might come around and knock on your door offering to do service projects or share uh, their testimony with you about the Book Mormon. We know them from their advertisements that promote happy families and we probably, some of you probably know them as good neighbors who are good moral people. And all of those things are the face of the Mormon church, but there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. So I wanna give you a caution, and I think you've, you'll hear this from any apologist who talks about other, other religions. There's a language barrier, and uh, we have Inigo Montoya here reminding us that people use words in different ways, okay? we need to be aware of the language barrier. So when you hear someone, for example, Glenn Beck, a popular Mormon speaker, he'll stand up on a stage and talk about words like the atonement. The atonement means so much to me, and he tears up. He talks about the scriptures, okay? And he refers to Jesus, and he's talking about these things. He's using the words that we know but he's using different meanings for those things. So as we go through this talk, we'll talk about some of those, uh, those different meanings for the words and how they use them and understand them. So the church was founded by a man named Joseph Smith and the official founding date is 1834. But before that, at age 14, he received what he 
uh, what is referred to within the church as the first vision. So there was a revivalism happening in his area of, of upstate New York, and he was confused with all the bickering between the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Baptists, and he didn't know which church to join. So he went out into the woods and found a quiet, secluded spot and uh, prayed, and he recounts this in multiple places, but something dark took control of him and he was in a panic. And then all of a sudden, a, a light descended from heaven. And in that light were two beings, the heavenly father and his son. So Smith claims that the father and the son appeared to him. And this image is a common image that Mormons use to depict this. This is probably one of the most popular images of this. And in, in light of his question about which church to join, uh, the heavenly father pointed to his son and said, hear him, very reminiscent of the language we hear uh, in places like the Transfiguration and others. And he told him that all of the churches and all of the professors of those churches were corrupt and that their creeds were an abomination to him. So none of those things were true. And that Joseph was to restore the uh, true gospel and restore the true church to the earth. So the Mormon church understands itself to be uh, the only true church on the earth and a restoration of a gospel that was corrupted over time. One of the problems with this is that there are multiple accounts, and the official account that you'll see if you open up a copy of the Book of Mormon in the front of it, uh, you'll find the account from 1838. But over time, there were different accounts, and they, they differ in details that are very significant, not just trying to harmonize them, but truly contradictions. And so there is, uh, there's doubt about what actually happened at this time. Sometime later, uh, the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph while he was sleeping in, in his uh, farmhouse with his family. And this is another one of those classic iconic images of Mormonism. So Moroni appears as an angel uh, to, to Smith in 1823. And he appears three times in the night, gives him a vision of going to a place and uh, receiving the golden plates. And after that vision, he was working with his father the next day and left, uh, went to this place uh, called the Hill Cumorah in New York State. And there he found the, where the plates were hidden and uncovered the box, but he was told he couldn't take them. And he had to come back four years and after four years, he was actually given the plates to take. During that time, there's, there were a lot of nefarious thing that things that happened in Smith's life. Uh, he was brought up on charges of treasure hunting by using a type of sorcery and other things. And, and there's accounts of this in the church history documents where he explains how he wasn't following God and then came back to God. In that box that was buried were the golden plates uh, the Urim and Thummim, seer stones, a breastplate, uh, a sword, and a liahona, which is a compass that was used by the ancient peoples, supposedly. And these images are often used to depict that. Moroni burying those plates, Smith uncovering them, and then using those things later. There's a little bit, again, different accounts about what was actually found in the box and, and how those things were uh, received and, and transmitted. So that's the basic idea of how the Mormon church came to be. So it's a very modern phenomenon. And it comes around about the, the same time as the Adventist movement is happening in, in New England as well. So related and connected to that. So what do Mormons believe about God? Well, first, Mormons would deny the Trinity. So they are not Trinitarian. And in fact, we would uh, describe them as a Unitarian uh, monotheism when they talk about God, but they believe in lots of different gods, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that point in just a minute. So they think they're monotheists, but they're really not uh, for the most part. So they talk about God as Heavenly Father. Uh, so whenever you hear somebody talking about Heavenly Father, that's a, a little bell should go off in your mind. This might be a Mormon I'm speaking to. And they refer to him as Elohim from the Old Testament, believe that he was a man that Jesus, who they often refer to as Jehovah in the Old Testament, was exalted to be a God, but he was the only begotten son in the flesh. And the Holy Ghost is a separate being of spirit. So they don't believe that there is one God, but there are many gods. 
And so we, we could rightly refer to them as polytheistic, but more technically, we might refer to them as henotheistic because they devote their worship to the, the Heavenly Father and to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit really isn't, um, he's honored and respected, but not offered worship in the sense that the Father and the Son are. So let's break each of those down a little bit further. So all of these, these three uh, persons and three beings, three distinct beings, are one in purpose and doctrine, but each having their own role. So separate in being, separate in body. So a very distinct idea from how we understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, at some point, there's an inhabitation on a planet near the star called Kolob, and this is recorded in the book of Abraham in the Pearl of Great Price. And the images again here that you see show the heavenly father and the son looking very similar to one another. And here in this child's cartoon drawing that they would use in their primary schools, uh, which is like our, our version of Sunday school, uh, that blanked out face for the spirit because he's a spirit being. So heavenly father is referred to as Elohim in the Old Testament, God in the New Testament, or the father. And he was once a man who was exalted to godhood. And he is now a man of flesh and bones, but not blood. Because in Mormon eschatology, after, the, after you're resurrected, uh, you don't have blood, only a body of, of flesh and bones. And he is the father of all people with his wives. And those people are referred to as his spirit children. And that'll come into play in a few minutes when we talk about uh, Jesus as well. So one of their prophets, Lorenzo Snow, had this little couplet, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. So they understand the idea of theosis, or becoming more like God, in a very literal sense. They believe that there's the potential for any human being to become a God, just like the Heavenly Father is God. And that idea comes very directly from Joseph Smith. So this isn't some secondary teaching or idea, but in a, uh, a sermon he delivered, often referred to as the King Follett Discourse in 1844, uh, he talked about uh, dispelling the idea of the Trinity and, and God as spirit. So let me read this extended quote. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret if the veil were rent today and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instruction from and walked, talked, and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. For I am going to tell you how God came to be God. For we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see these ideas are comprehensible to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another and that he was once a man like us. Yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. So he makes this very bold claim that God was a man who has been exalted to godhood and, and lived on a planet just like we do. So this is a very clear teaching of, of the Mormon church. So the son is referred to as Jehovah in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament, and he is the firstborn spirit child of Elohim. So he is the one who organized the worlds, Notice not the word created is not used, but organized. And he was born in, in, uh, as a son in the flesh. It's a common phrase that they'll use to describe his birth by Mary, who they say was a virgin, uh, but we'll uh, uncover that a little bit more in just a moment. He came to earth and perfectly obeyed the Father's will, and during the time in the preexistence, he perfectly obeyed as well. So there are some controversies within Mormonism about Jesus. Again, here's another iconic picture. You walk into most Mormon homes and you would probably see an image like this one in it. Uh, one of those controversies is that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. That might sound like a gotcha question to us, but 
that's no big deal to Mormons because they believe that everyone, every being that exists, all angels and, and spirits and humans are spirit children of Elohim. So to say that they're spirit brothers is not a big thing for them. And uh, it's just a, a common idea. I'm, I'm a spirit brother with Jesus and you are, they would say. So there's no real controversy in the Mormon mind about that, uh, even though we would, we would take exception to that. Another controversial point is that some of their prophets uh, from the earliest time, beginning with Brigham Young, who was the second prophet, said that Jesus was, or, I'm sorry, yeah, Jesus was born as a sexual union of the heavenly father and Mary. So they, since God is a man with flesh and bones, he had a physical relationship with Mary that sired the body of the human body of Jesus so that the spirit of Jesus could inhabit that and live on the earth and obey him. Um, many Mormons don't know that and they don't teach that as a common idea, but it has been taught throughout church history, uh, even as recent as Spencer Kimball, who was the president and prophet of the church when I was a child, and uh, Bruce McConkie and others. So many Mormons don't know that that's what the prophets have taught, but it, is, it has been a teaching in the past. And another idea, uh, especially promulgated by Joseph Smith himself, was that Jesus was married with multiple wives. And in one of his sermons, he described how the wedding in uh, Cana and Galilee was actually Jesus's wedding, that he wasn't going there for someone else's wedding but his own, and that some of the Marys and others who were listed as those women who followed him were actually his wives. So there's a very, uh, very different idea of who the Son is. The Holy Ghost is seen simply as a spirit being who doesn't have a body like the others, and he carries out the, the plans of the Father and the Son, uh, influences people for good, and is imparted in a ritual of the laying on of hands when a person is found worthy at a certain age to receive that, uh, usually around age 12 or 13. And uh, so very similar idea to the way the Bible describes the Holy Spirit, but they will often use the word Holy Ghost because they use the King James Bible. So the idea of other gods also comes into play in Mormonism because if Elohim was a man who was exalted by a god, and he will then in turn exalt other men to be gods, then there must be limitless gods in the past and in the future. So that's why we can rightly call Mormonism a polytheistic worldview, because they believe there are lots of gods. But this creates a very specific problem for them, and we call this in logic an infinite regress. Who was the first god? If god was made a god by a god, who was made by a god, who was made by a god, who was the first god? Uh, the typical Mormon response to that would be, we don't have to worry about that. That's something God hasn't revealed to us. There's only one God with, with whom we have to do, is a common phrase they'll use to, to talk about that. They're only worried about what the Elohim and Jehovah, they're the two gods we need to deal with. We don't need to worry about all that other stuff. Uh, but it's really a, a big logical problem within the worldview that shows the inconsistency of the worldview. Revelation in Mormonism, uh, thinking about their, their authority and their scriptures, is very, very, very complex. Uh, they have a modern prophet and a modern priesthood and presidents. So the modern prophet, beginning with Joseph Smith and, and that being transferred on down through the years, is referred to as the prophet, seer, and revelator. So they believe that there's ongoing modern revelation, modern prophecy, and they would uh, often use that as the, as the Mormon missionaries encounter people. They'll say, we believe there's still prophets today and they're still speaking and we, and we want to teach you about that. They believe in a modern priesthood and that priesthood was restored to the earth uh, by John the Baptist coming back as uh, an angel basically and conferring this on Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and that was the uh, reinstatement of the Aaronic priesthood. And then at some point later, Peter, James, and John appeared to them in the same manner and endowed the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the higher order of, of priesthood that they would receive um, for males only around the age of 18. So these gifts are given only to males within the church. So modern prophets, modern priesthood. Uh, they have a, a view of revelation in the four standard works and those standard works are often included in this type of book uh, that's called a quad. 
because it has all four, uh, the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price in it. And they also have a triple, which has just the, uh, all those three books except the Bible, and they'll use uh, other, uh, just a standard King James Bible. So when we think about Mormonism, they say that they believe in the Bible, and they'll, uh, you'll see a Mormon Bible is a King James print, but on the spine you'll see the imprint of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And there are notes added inside there. Now one interesting thing is Joseph Smith actually began to, to translate the Bible, but he didn't get it finished uh, before he died. But the Joseph Smith translation is actually not used by the modern Mormon church. And there's a whole big long story about how that came to be. But uh, the Bible in their eighth article of faith says, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. And that little phrase allows them to interpret the Bible however they want to. And it is the presidency, the first presidency and the prophet uh, who are the, the main interpreters of the Bible at any point in time. So if you try to point something out from the Bible that contradicts other Mormon scriptures, they'll say, well, that's not translated correctly. So there's a whole nother opportunity to talk about manuscript evidence and transmission of the text, things that Joseph Smith had no clue about when he uh, invented this religion. The Book of Mormon is officially titled Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. And this image, again, is representing Jesus coming to the Americas during the time between his uh, death and, and resurrection and preaching there in the Americas. And the people who were in the Americas at that time were actually recording all of these things. And the translation of the Book of Mormon begins around 1827 after uh, Smith had received the plates after waiting for the four years. First printed in 1830, another big crazy story about some false prophecies involved in that as well. And the latest edition with changes has actually come out in 2013 and they've made some adjustments to that. Despite the fact that Smith claimed that the Book of Mormon was the most perfect book ever produced, it's had thousands of changes through the years. And again, most Mormons don't know that because they have their current copy and they don't know the history and they don't teach them the history of those things. These, uh, the Book of Mormon comes, if you look in the front matter, there's these four plates. The plates of Ether talk about a group of uh, followers of Jared, the Jaredites. They left from Babel in barges and came to the Americas. Uh, so this would have been, in their view, around 2700 BC. And they lived in Central America area and were wiped out by around 600 BC. They left these records, and these records were later found by Nephi, a later prophet. Uh, Lehi and his family, fled the destruction of Jerusalem around 600 BC, and they brought with them to the Americas the Old Testament up to Zedekiah. And that's what the plates of brass are. And the plates of Nephi then are those uh, records of Nephi and his descendants, Lehi, his son, and basically the struggle between the Nephites, the good guys, and the Lamanites, the bad guys. The Nephites are the light-skinned God followers, and the Lamanites, the dark-skinned Satan followers, basically. And this supposedly explains the Jewish ancestry of Native Americans, which we know from modern DNA studies is absolutely false. Uh, one of those very interesting things that they will try to, try to prove, but uh, cannot, be, cannot be demonstrated to be consistent with reality. The Plates of Mormon were a later prophet named Mormon who abridged these uh, different plates and put them together and, and consolidated them. And it gives the account of the people in the Americas. And then they were buried by his son Moroni on, in the Hill Cumorah in upstate New York in AD 421. These are the, this is how the Mormon story goes. So that's where the Book of Mormon comes from is all of these ancient records, supposed ancient records from the Americas. Now, I put the word translation in quote marks because when we think of a translation, we think of we're looking at a Greek text of the New Testament and we're reading it off the page and, and transferring it into English or Spanish or Russian or whatever language it is. Uh, the idea of translation there in the Mormon concept is very different. They believe that Smith was able to do this by the gift and power of God and that the Urim and Thummim, which were in that box with uh, the golden plates, 
were given to him to translate these plates. And there are many different representations of these. You can see a picture there of Smith wearing the breastplate with the uh, Urim and Thummim set in these silver spectacles. So it's peeping through these stones and that would allow him to look at the plates and read and translate the information. But that's really not what happened. And other accounts actually describe Smith sitting with his face inside of a hat while he was uh, in a different room or on the stairs. He would put this stone, and this is the actual seer stone that he used. He put this stone into a hat, buried his face into the hat, and he claimed that the words would basically uh, what we would think of as scrolling across the screen today, he says the words would appear to him in the stone. So this is no form of translation, it's a form of, of divination or sorcery that he used to get this information. And there are other various accounts about him sitting a, across the table with a sheet placed between he and the, the scribe, or even sitting at the table with them. So lots of contradictions in the way that the Book of Mormon's received. And, and they're open about these things. These are pictures that are up all over Mormon websites and, and Mormon teachings. Uh, so it's just a very, a very confusing mess of how the Book of Mormon actually came to be. But they'll still demand it was by the gift and power of God and claim it's a miracle. So the, the Book of Mormon itself has lots of internal contradictions. It contradicts the Bible, and there's no archeological evidence that supports any of those people groups being in the Americas, Central America, North America, in any of those times. Uh, this image is, again, depicting a battle between the Nephites, light-skinned guy on the left, and the Lamanites, the dark-skinned guy, and all the weaponry and, and metal and chariots and horses and all of these things that they supposedly had, which there's absolutely zero archeological evidence for. Uh, so unlike the Bible, which when we read about the Hittites, uh, we can go find the city where the Hittites lived and look at their culture and civilization. None of that can be corroborated. And much of the uh, Book of Mormon is actually copied from the King James Version of the Bible, uh, which is uh, a large portion of that coming out of Isaiah. So very significant issues with the scriptures. And another big issue is the golden plates and other articles that were given to Smith were actually given back to Moroni. And so we can't examine the plates today. And there was even a portion of those plates that were sealed up. There's, con uh, again, contradictory accounts. They're either in a cave near the Hill Cumorah or they gave him back to Moroni and he took them to heaven. Uh, there, there's just conflicting uh, information about where they actually are. But there's no chance, like we have today, to examine the manuscripts and, and check their authenticity of translation. So there's no way to independently authenticate them. So the, that's the Bible, the Book of Mormon. The third book is called The Pearl of Great Price, and it contains the Book of Moses, the Book of Abraham, and a couple other things like the Articles of Faith. And uh, Smith claims that these scrolls, which he purchased from a traveling salesman uh, as things were being plundered out of Egypt in the early 19th century and spread all over the world, this traveling salesman came through, he bought these, he claimed that he could translate them and that they were actually part of the Book of Abraham. And here's a, an image, we have these today, the actual scrolls that Smith had. Uh, his wife, when he died, his wife, who went off to a different sect of the church, took them with her. And so they're still around today. And he said he could fill in the blanks, the missing pieces from this. And this is the image that he produced from that scroll. And you'll find this inside of any Book of Mormon, um, or in a triple with the Pearl of Great Price. You'll find that in there. Well, the problem is, anybody notice that little crocodile down in the bottom and those little canopic jars? You probably all recognize this as a funerary script from ancient Egypt. And now that we can read these hieroglyphics, people have translated these, and they have nothing to do with Abraham. And this was a big embarrassment for the church uh, when these things were translated. And they've tried to do some damage control over the last few years. And that's one of the major changes in the 2013 update is trying to explain away these translation issues uh, from the supposed ancient Egyptian into the book of Abraham. The Doctrine and Covenants are the fourth book or the DNC as they're often referred to. These have a lot of proclamations and prophecies that were given by Smith and, and other later prophets and announcements uh, by the church councils. And uh, these were revealed over time. So there are lots of changes within the Doctrine and Covenants. 
uh, with things like the polygamy and the priesthood, who could receive this and that and, and the timing. And there are also uh, many, many contradictions in the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, not only with itself, but with the Book of Mormon, with the Bible, with other things. For example, in Doctrine and Covenants uh, section 121, they refer to them as sections in this book, not chapters. According to that which was ordained in the midst of the counsel of the eternal God of all other gods before this world was. What does this tell us about God? It says there were other gods. But in the Book of Mormon, and now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. So in response to a question about how many gods there are, we have in one uh, Mormon writing, many gods, and in the other, one God. And in fact, this description from 2 Nephi, one of the books in the Book of Mormon, actually sounds a lot like a Trinitarian view, doesn't it? Okay, but they deny that. Other things in the Doctrine and Covenants, polygamy is commanded, and in the Book of Mormon, it's condemned. And the view of polygamy actually changed over time as you read through the Doctrine and Covenants. In Doctrine and Covenants, God has a body. In the Book of Mormon, God is a spirit who doesn't have a body. And man pre-existed, according to the DNC, and he did not pre-exist, according to the Book of Mormon. So even within their own writings, things that Smith produced himself, uh, it's such a convoluted system that he couldn't even keep things straight and winds up contradicting himself. As far as man goes, uh, I mentioned earlier that they view man as uh, spirit children of Elohim. So they would consider everyone who's ever lived on the planet, and indeed every spiritual being who hasn't been born as a, spiritual, a spirit child of Elohim and one of his heavenly wives. And those uh, spirit children then can receive a, uh, a body, and we'll, we'll talk about how that all progresses. But the, the creation of spirit children, because God has a body of flesh and bones, and so does his wives, this is an actual physical sexual union that produces these spirit children, and they have eternally existed as intelligences. So intelligences become spirit children, which then take on a body, and uh, it's, it gets very interesting. This diagram uh, I've, I've taken uh, with the benefit from Dr. James White, as he's uh, helped me understand a lot of these things as well. And this is what we think of as the universal Mormon decoder ring. Okay, this is the, if you want the flow chart to figure all these things out, this is it. And you can find it in uh, volume one of the, the World Religions and Cults book. Uh, so the yellow arrow now is pointing to where the heavenly father and mothers would have been in the eternal realm, or the heavenly realm, and intelligences and matter existed somewhere near Kolob. And they were then, uh, the spirit children then become uh, beings, spirit beings, through this union, and they're here in what they call the pre-existence or the pre-mortal existence. And then, after that, they get to move from the pre-mortal existence and receive a body on earth. And they pass through a veil that they call the veil of forgetfulness. So you don't remember what happened in your pre-mortal existence, and you come to earth, and there's this probationary period. So everyone, in their view, is a child of God. And they would take exception to a passage like, John 1.12 that says only those who receive Christ are children of God. Uh, so they would, they would take offense to the idea that, that we're not all children of God. Only those who are in Christ have, have been given the right to be called children of God. They again believe that man is created in the literal physical image of God. It's not a uh, metaphorical idea to them. And that all of Adam's descendants will face a physical death because of his uh, uh, consequence of his actions, but they deny the idea of original sin and the stain of sin. You're accountable for your own actions, not Adam's actions. And very clear statements that we, uh, we are never uh, judged or punished for Adam's actions, only our own actions. Uh, and that ties into their, their idea of, of the fall being a good thing. In Mormonism, the fall is a positive action because it actually gives man a chance to get back to God. If the fall never happened and sin never entered the world and everybody was good, then you wouldn't have a chance to fight sin and show how good you are to prove yourself worthy to go back and live with Heavenly Father. And this ties into their view of what they call free agency. 
So this would be along the lines of a, a semi-Pelagian view of uh, the will of man uh, bordering on Pelagianism where man's basically good and can, can earn his way to God. So free agency is the word that they would use for free will. And they believe that we can do good works to please God. And this, of course, stands in direct contrast to passages like Romans 8, 7 and 8 that say that it's impossible for the unregenerate man to please God. And he cannot please God. He's not able to do so. And uh, they would deny that because then nobody, nobody has the chance to prove that they're good. Uh, so you can start to see the very works righteous uh, basis of their view of salvation as well. Uh, we pretty much agree with their concept of sin. Uh, they hold a pretty biblical view of sin, but uh, they would differ in a few places. They would strongly agree with us that sin must be individually repented of. They really emphasize forgiveness and, and applying forgiveness, uh, and that each person must do their best to choose the right. I had one of these little green rings when I was a kid, and you'd wear it on your finger, have the poster on the wall, the bookmarks, all of those things, to remind you that you always needed to choose the right. And CTR, choose the right, and the catch a little songs for primary. Uh, so a very, a very legalistic attitude towards sin, and, and that's because of their view of, of salvation. They need that legalistic view uh, to, to accomplish those works. So they do add to Scripture in some ways by talking about things like the word of wisdom, uh, which is where they get the idea of not drinking any alcohol or coffee and other strong drinks and certain foods. Uh, many, many Mormons follow parts of the word of wisdom and not others, and a uh, very interesting thing there, some of the hypocrisy within the church. And they really focus on living a happy life. Happiness is emphasized over and over and over. How do I be happy? And that's, that's really their focus. It's not about glorifying God necessarily, but about me being happy. And if I want to be happy, I have to obey Heavenly Father, and then I'll earn his favor. And posters like these uh, would be hung up in homes to remind children to behave and, and be obedient. So in light of their view of sin, their view of salvation is that man is on earth in a probation to be tested, and the goal then is to be live worthy to return to live with the Heavenly Father. So again, if you hear somebody talking about returning back to Heavenly Father, those are Mormon buzzwords. Those should clue you in. The person I'm talking to is probably a Mormon. And uh, the idea of salvation is one of those words that you can't use with a Mormon the way that we can talk about it with one another. They have an absolutely different view of the word salvation. Everyone gets saved because their view of salvation is actually related to the idea of physical resurrection and Adam's physical death and physical resurrection. So pretty much everybody's gonna be saved because everybody is gonna be resurrected in the end. So if you tell them they need to get saved, they'll blink twice and not know what you're talking about. That's an area we need to define those terms. And their uh, usage of salvation is also often equated with the idea of being exalted to a God. Uh, so very different terms. And rather than uh, talking about hell, they will usually refer to outer darkness. But this is for them a view uh, that's re a place that's reserved for very, very few people. Almost no one will go there. The only people who are guaranteed to go there are Satan and those who rebelled in the pre-existence, they never receive bodies, they're doomed to a spiritual existence, and the sons of perdition, which I'm probably a part of, because I received baptism, I received the priesthood, I was walking in the faith, and then I'm now rebelling against that uh, and denying that that is the truth. But there are different views about who those sons of perdition are uh, within the church. Their view of salvation leads them to a resurrection in one of three levels of heaven, and they draw this out of 1 Corinthians 15. So they're using the Bible to talk about these three different degrees of glory, and on T-shirts and, and little uh, logos, window stickers. If you see this sticker uh, sitting on someone's desk or uh, T-shirt, this person is a Mormon. And the asterisk, if you'll notice here, uh, you have the first circle on the left is the pre-existence, the first line, is the veil, and then the circle in the center with the asterisk, the star, you are here. That's the earthly existence. Then there will be a death, which is the next line. And then that divided area are the spirits in paradise and the spirits in prison waiting for the resurrection and the judgment, which are represented by the next two lines. 
Then the three degrees of heaven and the bottom one, that tiny little dot down there, that's outer darkness because there won't be very many people there. So they think of heaven, the highest level of heaven, they call the celestial kingdom, and it itself is divided into three layers, and the uppermost layer is where you're exalted to godhood, and that's the glory of the sun with the father and son present. The terrestrial level, the middle level, has the glory of the presence of the sun, so they equate it to the moon. Uh, again, from 1 Corinthians 15, glory of the sun, the moon, and the stars, the telestial, a word that Joseph Smith made up to describe this lower level. Glory apart from the Father of the Son, but it's still a glory, a glorious state. So those are represented here on the decoder chart. And uh, whether you have lived a good life, whether you've been baptized, and all these pieces play into where you fit into one of those levels of heaven in the end. Now, the um, law of eternal progression is the idea of being exalted to godhood, that, that couplet that we used earlier about becoming like God. And to be exalted to be more and more like the heavenly father is the goal and indeed to achieve a status of godhood like he is. Only men who are sealed in the temple and are faithful Mormons and have obeyed the principles and ordinances of the gospel and have wives through these temple ceremonies really have the opportunity to become like Elohim is. So it's not everybody can become a god. There are some, there are some specific uh, pathways that have to be accomplished there. Uh, so a very, a very selective system. So it's not accurate to say uh, to a Mormon single lady, oh, you think you get to become a god. That's not true. That's not the way they would understand it. And, and not a really good way to introduce uh, a discussion with somebody anyway. So when, we, when they talk about the gospel, they have a radically different view of the gospel as well. With the four principles of the gospel are faith in Jesus Christ, repentance for your sins, baptism for the remission of sins, and laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. So they have a fourfold gospel. Uh, these are the four elements of the gospel. And that's why, for them, baptism is so extremely important. If you have not been baptized at the resurrection, you cannot achieve the celestial kingdom. So to get to the celestial kingdom, you must be baptized. So in their temple ceremonies, uh, they will actually do baptisms for the dead because they want to get their uh, dead ancestors and relatives baptized so that they can be with them in the celestial kingdom. And this is why the Mormon community has such a strong interest in genealogy and why many of the mainstream genealogy companies are actually uh, run and owned by Mormons because they're developing these roles. They take them to the temple and then you do a proxy baptism in these baptismal fonts so that that person in the after uh, life can be uh, exalted to that celestial kingdom. Without that, you have no hope of, of achieving the celestial kingdom. Uh, I actually did participate in uh, these proxy baptisms in the temple in Logan, Utah. And uh, so that's part of my experience uh, being baptized for the dead in the church. So again, the yellow arrow, the mortal existence here on earth after you die, the faithful Mormons will go to the uh, area called the spirits in paradise there in the center, and unfaithful people will go to the spirit prison, and there's an uh, interaction between those people there. So this is a very works-oriented. You have to be a faithful Mormon to achieve this next level of spirits in paradise. And in uh, 2 Nephi 25-23, we read, for we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. Sounds good so far, right? <laughs> For we know that it is by grace that we are saved. Sounds good so far, right? After all we can do. Grace plus works. And we know very clearly, as Paul says, if, if grace requires works, then it's not grace at all. So their doctrine of works is very clear. And in the book of uh, Moroni, chapter 10, yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you that, it is, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. Okay? Conditional salvation upon your works. So their view is that you're saved by grace after all you can do if you deny yourself and love God perfectly. That's great news, right? 
And now that sounds like a lot of work. And if we stop and think about it, this is very contrary to what we read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created for good works, which he prepared beforehand. And so very contrary to scripture. And this is always a great question to ask a Mormon. So you really think you've done your best? Okay. They have this little phrase that they wouldn't necessarily use a lot uh, amongst others, but you do your best and Jesus does the rest. Have you really done your best to love God? What are you gonna do with all those sins? And they'll appeal to God's grace still, but a very works righteous idea. Their view of atonement, as I mentioned earlier, is very different. Uh, it was begun in Gethsemane. Again, here's another picture that you'll probably see uh, in a Mormon home, but you'll never see a picture of a crucifixion scene because they focus on the atonement happening in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus is pleading and the blood that he sweat, and that's an emphasis rather than the cross. So you'll never see Mormons wearing crucifixes or crosses. You'll never see a cross in their buildings, their ward buildings or on the temples. And the, the crucifixion uh, was the end of the atonement, but it was really the work in Gethsemane that they focus on. So that uh, he accomplished that for people that they could earn their way to heaven. But it's only effective for those who use their free agency to obey God perfectly. And their Jesus is not a sufficient savior. He does not pay a penalty that is sufficient to cover all of your sins you still have to uh, work your way to, to earn that favor with God. After death, they believe there's a second chance to hear and respond to the gospel. So those unfaithful people who went to the spirit, uh, the spirit prison, these spirits in prison, the people in the paradise, spirits in paradise, would actually kind of serve as missionaries and they would come and preach the gospel to the spirits in prison, offer them a second chance. If they receive the gospel there and trust in the plan of salvation, then they have an opportunity to be resurrected into one of the other levels of heaven. If they have been baptized by proxy, then they can eventually get to the celestial kingdom. If not, the most they can hope for is the terrestrial kingdom. If they were good people, or if they're fairly immoral people, they would get the telestial kingdom, the, the lower level. So that's again, is very contrary to what we read in, in uh, Hebrews 9, 27. We know that there's judgment uh, and comes immediately after death. It's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Their view of origins is a little tricky to deal with because there's no official doctrine on the concept of uh, naturalistic evolution and those types of things from the church. They do believe that Adam is a primal parent of our race. So there's official statements from the First Presidency that talk about Adam being a real person. And uh, the Book of Abraham describes the Mormon creation story and it kind of imitates what we read in Genesis 1. Here's a small excerpt of it. And there stood one among them that was like unto God and he said unto those who were with him, we will go down for there is space there and we will take of these materials and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. So that's Jehovah or Jesus speaking about how he organized and formed the earth from pre-existing matter. So it wasn't something that was created ex nihilo out of nothing as we read from the Bible, but, a, but an organization of something that already existed. And the people already existed as intelligences and they were in the spirit realm at this time as well. So very different uh, and, and many contradictions with what we had understand in the Bible. But they would typically, uh, deny human evolution and, and those types of things. So of course we wanna make sure that we take all of this information that we've been hearing. Um, you're not gonna memorize all this and this is a tiny fraction of what they really believe. And, and as we think about all this, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by all of these facts and details that you've been thinking about this week. And one of the best ways to not get overwhelmed is to think about, rather than memorizing everything everybody believes, which is not fruitful, uh, but to get a basic idea of what they believe and be able to ask good questions. The reason we started the book series and this conference with a, a, a strong exposition of what biblical Christianity is, is because we want you to know the truth 
so that you can recognize the errors. And all you need to do to interact with anyone of any faith, if you're flying on a plane out of here and sit next to somebody of the Baha'i faith and you have no clue what they believe, all you have to do is ask questions. What do you believe about the nature of God? What do you believe about revelation? What do you believe about sin? Let them explain, listen carefully and respectfully, and then share with them what the Bible says about those things. Uh, so don't get overwhelmed by these things. But let's talk about some strategies for, for reaching out to Mormons. Always remember that you are talking to an individual who is made in the image of God. Okay? Never forget that. Don't think about faceless, nameless people, uh, but think about individuals. And the goal is that you're going to exalt the person and work of Jesus Christ and point them, as 1 Peter 3, 14 through 17 instructs us, to the hope that is in you. Your hope is hopefully in nothing but Jesus Christ. And point them to the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And it's not about winning arguments, but about souls that will stand around the throne of God and offer him glory and praise forever. That's our ultimate objective. Colossians 4 is a very important passage for me as I consider my uh, evangelistic endeavors and, and strategies and as I teach. And notice that it starts out with prayer. Continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You're talking to an individual. Listen to what they believe, share what the Bible believes, and interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. Some things that you should not do as you're talking to Mormons, and some of these would apply to any, uh, to any groups. Don't make fun of Kolob and temple garments and Smith's false prophecies and peeping into a hat. Um, if you stop and think about it, we believe some pretty crazy things too, okay? as far as the world is concerned, and, and that's the foolishness of the gospel. Uh, if, if someone came to you, if an atheist came to you and started talking about how you believe your, your sky daddy and your zombie Jesus are gonna save you, you'd find that very offensive, and you'd be turned off immediately. The same thing's gonna happen if you start doing those types of things with a Mormon making fun of their underwear, their, their secret magic underwear, and where's Kolob at anyway? Okay. Those are things that are not demonstrating a Christ-like attitude. Don't accuse them uh, of polygamy. Now, there are some sects of the church that have branched off that still do practice polygamy, uh, but today the, the modern church based out of, uh, of Salt Lake City does not, and they condemn that. Don't assume that the words you're using have the same meaning or the words they say have the same meaning. What do you mean by that? You can all say that. When they talk about the atonement, okay, if I ever get a chance to, to meet Glenn Beck and he uses the word atonement, I'm gonna say, what do you mean by the atonement? And then I'm gonna tell him what the real Jesus Christ did in the atonement. Don't assume they know what the older prophets taught because a lot of the things are recorded in obscure books and, and they don't really know those things. So ask them, does your church believe or do you believe that this is the case? And then respond appropriately if you wanna demonstrate some of the false prophecies or contradictory ideas that are presented. And don't invite them over for a cup of coffee, <laughs> okay? This is, this is just one of those uh, little foibles. We need to be aware as we're seeking to share the gospel with people, uh, some of their uh, sensitivities and uh, invite them in for a, a drink of water or a glass of lemonade or something like that, but don't offer them coffee or tea because uh, that would be offensive to them. So how do we reach out? Do ask questions about what they believe. Show some interest and, and try and understand what they really believe and then use those answers as opportunities to step into the gospel. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about that and open up the scriptures with them, and never be afraid to open up the Bible. They've usually, if they're coming door-to-door as missionaries, they've got a King James Bible with them. 
so they can open up their Bible and read those things right out of the Bible, just like you can. Uh, so there's really no difference in the Bible that we use. So point them to those things in the scriptures, open them up. Do try to show them some of the inconsistencies, the contradictions, the false prophecies that are present in their worldview. They've never been taught these things. Right? We, we try to do apologetics, and, and Answers in Genesis focuses on apologetics to try to deal with contradictions and all these different claims. Uh, they typically don't do that within Mormonism. They're very focused on faith and receiving things by faith, and they don't get caught up in that. There are Mormon apologists and, and groups that deal with these things, uh, but for the most part, the average Mormon doesn't know about a lot of those things. Uh, but do those things with gentleness and, and reverence or meekness and fear, that we do that in a respectful way, not a mocking way. And do be patient and willing to engage over time. Most Mormons, uh, Mormonism is actually a shame culture, and to leave the Mormon church is going to produce broken relationships and families. It's gonna produce shunning from the church, and it's, it's very hard. Um, there's actually a very dark side to Mormonism, and there, it's very oppressive, and people are held to this standard of perfection, and there's, there's darkness, and there's suicide, and there's depression um, that have, have affected me personally, and it's to be patient and loving with these people, to, to walk with them as they uh, try to understand these things is extremely important. Absolutely take the time to point them to the rest that we have in Christ. He has accomplished everything for me. I don't have to work for my salvation. I get to work and rejoice in my salvation and do those things that God has prepared for me. I have an article in Answers Magazine, and this image, one of the... Uh, artists produce is just so perfect to describe the Mormon faith. You're digging a hole and throwing it into the backpack on your back. Okay? You're never going to get anywhere. You can't dig your way out of that hole. You can't earn your own salvation. They're weary from trying to earn their salvation, whether they admit it or not. Okay? Point them to the rest that we have in Christ. A couple of very simple um, strategies, and there are lots of resources from different ministries who focus on Mormonism, uh, who, who detail these. Uh, Dr. Ron Rhodes' books, Reasoning from the Scriptures with Mormons, uh, one of the ones that I would commend to you most. Ask them, did Jesus or Heavenly Father create the spiritual beings? And they're gonna reply, well, the spirit children were all created by the Heavenly Father and, and the Heavenly Mother. They usually don't refer to Heavenly Mother in that way, but they'll talk about uh, the creation of those beings. Then, ask them to read Colossians 1, 15 and 16. And in there, we see, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. The next question, who is the he referred to in this passage? And if we look back up the context, it's the son, Jesus is the creator of all of these spiritual beings. And Hebrews 1 talks about this as well. So there are many places in the Bible that, that refer to this. So the conclusion, if we think about what the Bible teaches in light of what Mormon theology teaches, is that Jesus can't be a created being, a spirit child of Elohim, because he's the creator of all of those things. So point them to these inconsistencies and tell them to study these things out and understand them. A second strategy would deal with uh, the number of gods. Ask them the question, are there more gods than Heavenly Father? And of course, they're gonna say, yes, there are many gods, and many gods will come in the future. And then ask them to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 10. There we read, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Ask them, who's speaking in this passage? And notice the word Lord here is in most translations is in all caps, indicating that this is Yahweh, who they would understand to be Jehovah, who is Jesus in, Mormon. they, in Mormonism. They'll probably say, oh, it's Heavenly Father but point out the word Lord and explain to them the Lord is where, where we uh, 
use that as a, a convention to indicate the name Yahweh, who they believe is Jesus. So Jesus is saying these things. And the Mormon concept of God is absolutely falsified because they have the wrong God speaking in their system. And there are no gods before me, and there will be no gods after me. Okay? So these passages out of Isaiah and other places totally refute the Mormon view. So as you, uh, as you go out of here thinking about these things, as you consider these things in your neighborhood, in your home, as, as these dear young people come and knock on your door, don't go hide in the laundry room and pretend they're not there, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Engage them. Reach out to them with the love and the hope of Christ. Right? These young elders, these young sisters who come to you, these thousands of faithful who pour into the general conference twice a year and listen all over the world, they are people made in the image of God. They are lost in a false system, a deception brought from Satan. If we think about the Mormon story, Paul tells us in, in Galatians that, that we should deny anyone who brings another gospel. Let him be accursed. And he tells us in 2 Corinthians that even if an angel of light should deliver these things and that, that Satan transforms him into an angel of light. So if an angel of light brings you a different gospel, we should deny it, it's false. And that's exactly how Mormonism came about. An angel of light delivered another gospel to Joseph Smith. Okay? It's a false system. And we need to point them to the true Christ, the only one who can provide salvation and rest for their souls. Thank you.